But today is a good day. The Bible says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And I think that is a mindset that we go that, yes, there are going to be difficulties in life. For the past year, we've been driven crazy with some of the regulations and the isolation, and we just don't know what to do next. But I really believe that our attitude is a choice. David wrote, he said, this is the day that the Lord has made. Now, some days are better than others. Anybody agree with that? Some days are just better than others. A day at the beach is better than a day at work. I mean, that's just my opinion, okay? But a day at the beach is better than a day at work. And it kind of get an amen, kind of get a witness there, all right? Or maybe you're a mountain type of person. You like mountains. Um, but it's a choice. It is a choice as to how we are going to respond to what God puts in our path. Now, that's very important because if you say this is the day that the Lord has made, whether it's a good day or not, then you can rejoice and be glad. And I think what that is is seeing the things that maybe others don't see when they're discouraged or upset or angry or unthankful. But when we can see what God has done, when we can see the blessings that God has put there, then we can rejoice about what God is doing in our life. And I really want to challenge you to do that today because I think today is a great day. And we can rejoice and serve the Lord today, and we can rejoice and be happy today. Well, today I want to talk to you for a few minutes, continuing our Doing Our Part series. Um, we, and in Doing Our Part, of course, we're talking about we want to move. We don't want just to move. We want to see a move of God. And what we're doing is we're transitioning. We're moving to a new facility. We're buying a new facility. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're uh, just following what God is leading us to do as a church. And in order to do that, this project is going to cost somewhere probably around $2 million total. And uh, we want to raise as much money as we can. We'd love to raise the money to uh, pay for everything just right off the bat. But we need to raise this money in order to, to make this move that is going to help us. Remember, anything we talk about, anything we talk about making a commitment to, anything we talk about taking an offering, it's about one thing. It is about reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. That's all it's about. It's not about buildings. The church is not a building. I make that mistake sometimes. Hey, we're going to go up to the church. Well, we're talking about going to a building where the church meets. You are the church. I am a part of the church. And so God has called us together to minister, to be his representatives here in this world, to bring the good news of the gospel to everyone, everywhere. That's our job. And so what we're doing is simply a way to be able to position ourselves financially, to position ourselves uh, to be able to grow and to reach more people. And that's what it really is all about. Well, today I want to talk to you about this thought. Doing our part requires grace giving. Grace giving. Now, what is grace giving? We talk about sacrificial giving. We talk about giving a tithe. We talk about giving an offering. But what is grace giving? Well, in a nutshell, grace giving is simply realizing that God's grace has been poured out on you, recognizing the grace of God in your life, seeing with a thankful heart what God has done, and responding from there. It's not responding to some knuckleheaded preacher that's trying to get you to give money. That was a reference to me, in case you're wondering, okay? Uh, it's not responding in that way out of obligation. It's not responding out of pressure. If you feel pressure, and I've said this before, you can keep your money, all right? We're not trying to pressure you. We're trying to get you to get a bigger picture of who Jesus is. And the more I look at Jesus, the more I'm in a relationship with him, the more I grow in that relationship with him, then you know what happens? Then my idea, my generosity, my idea of my relationship with God grows. And then it's a joy. That's why the Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. That's why Jesus said that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, that's a hard one to believe, isn't it? But if you're a parent, you know this to be true. Um, at Christmas time, would you rather watch your young child 
get this beautiful expression of joy and happiness on his or her face, wouldn't you rather watch that than to get one of those dad ties? I mean, wouldn't you just rather have that, the joy of watching your kids or, or some ugly Christmas sweater? How many have ever ha- owned or had an ugly Christmas sweater? Anybody? All right, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, some of you are wearing yours today. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Though I do see some things that are ugly, I, but that's a different thought. But nevertheless, uh, in God's house, in church, you're all beautiful, all right? Turn to the person next to you and said, he called me beautiful. Just go ahead and do it. He called me beautiful. That means you're good looking, all right? So, um, and uh, I look through this crowd and most of you are. Others, I have to take it by grace, all right? So that's all I'm saying. But we're talking about grace giving. What is it? Well, it's responding to God with a heart of joy and thankfulness. That's all it is. So today we're going to read a story about a real church. Uh, It was the church at Corinth. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You can follow along on your smartphone or you can just watch on the screen. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, there was this real church. And you know what was about this church? Many of the people in that church were not very wealthy. In fact, a lot of them weren't even considered middle class. A lot of them were considered very poor. And so we're going to read their story and what they did. They learned the power of giving the tithe, and then they learned the power of grace giving. And so that's what we're looking at in this Doing Our Part campaign. So grace, we know what grace is in Christian circles. Grace is the unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor and kindness of God. That's all it is. God looks at me. And he does not see somebody worthy because of what I've done. Do you know why God saved me? Do you know why God saved you? It's very simple, because of the work of Jesus and because of the love of the heavenly father that gave his only son to die in our place, to become human and represent us as a human being, but also die in our place as God the son. And that way we're able to be made right with God. Because you know what? It's not about how good you are. You can be as good as a person that has ever walked the face of this earth. But you know what the Bible says? There is none that does enough good that our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's what the Bible says. In other words, all of our goodness, it doesn't amount to much. It certainly won't buy us one moment in heaven. And what God wants us to understand is that it it is his grace. It is his grace. We don't earn it. We certainly don't deserve it. And we certainly don't merit it, but God gives it to us freely anyway. And throughout the Bible, the word grace also means favor or blessing. And so when we talk about grace giving, we're talking about learning how to give in response to our uh, picture of Jesus, but also to learn how that God will bless us and pour out his favor on our life when we do just this. We're going to read this text today and see how that actually happened to this real live church, a group of people that had real problems like you and I have. They worked real jobs. They had real family issues and many of them were poor, but they learned the joy of grace giving. So we're going to begin reading in verse number one of second Corinthians chapter nine. This is the apostle Paul writing. He said, I don't really need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. Let me just pause here. What had happened was, if you know the story, if you've read your Bible, you know that in the book of Acts, um, that the power of God fell. Jesus had died on the cross. He had resurrected from the grave. He had appeared to hundreds of people after his resurrection, and he had ascended back to heaven. And God told them, he said, look, just wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And on that day of Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit fell. I believe the church was birthed at that moment and God began to work in ways that he had never worked before in the history of the world. Well, that first day that the power of the Holy Spirit fell, the apostle Peter preached and 3,000 people were saved and baptized on that one day. What a day. What a glorious day. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to see 3,000 people give their life to Christ and follow him in baptism in a single day? Man, my back hurts just thinking about baptizing all those people. But it's a glorious thing. They uh, had been, uh, the churches started there and what had happened was it grew exponentially. 3,000, 
10,000, 20,000. It just kept growing. People kept being saved. And eventually what began to happen was because that church was so uh, growing so much, persecution happened. The church there began to be persecuted by the Roman government. You say, why would God allow that to happen? Because then uh, many of these Christians dispersed throughout the entire world. And as a result of that, you know what happened? The gospel was preached, uh, churches were started, and what had happened was many of these people at Jerusalem who were wealthy or they were middle class or they had all that they needed, now they had become very poor, many of them. Because many of them, the persecution was that they lost their job. Um, and, And so they began to be persecuted. And so believers that had been saved as a result of this ministry, they took an offering to help the people there in Jerusalem. So that's what's happening. So Paul continues, he said, for I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you and Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin begin giving. So not only were they giving and helping people that were in need, they were stirring up others with their example. But I'm sending these brothers to be sure that you really are ready, as I've been telling them, and your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all, and I told them. So I thought I'd send these brothers ahead of me to make sure that the gift you promise is ready, but I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. And remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds We'll get a small crop. Now, he's talking to this group of people here that had made this promise. They were giving. They were being blessed. And he says, I want you to make sure this offering is ready. He said, because, you know, God's going to bless you. He said, but look, if you only plant a few seeds, in other words, if you only give a little bit, you're going to get a little bit of a blessing. He said, but if you go beyond that, then you're going to get a greater blessing. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your own heart how much to give. Once again, the willing gift, not grudging, decide in your own heart. So you're not giving from pressure. You're not giving from obligation. You're giving from vision. You're giving from what you can see God doing through you when you are together with other believers. You are giving in order to spread the gospel around the world. You're giving so that people who don't know Jesus can come to know Jesus. You're giving because you want to. Because God has touched you. Because you're grateful for what Jesus has done for you. He says you must decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And I've said this many times at our church. We at Avalon Church love cheerful givers. But we'll take it from a grouch. All right. So just in case you're wondering. All right. But no, we want you to do this not out of being forced to. We don't want you to feel beat up when you come to church. We don't want you to feel like that somebody's pressuring you. We want you to learn to see who Jesus is and learn to love him more. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, and this is from the Old Testament, it's a quote from the Old Testament, they share freely and give generously to the poor, their good deeds will be remembered forever. And that's what God says about you. When you give, and it's not about how much, but when you give out of love for Jesus, when you give out of a vision that God has given you, when you give out of prayer, when you give because you see that God is going to use you in a greater way than you ever thought possible, what he's saying here is that their good deeds will be remembered forever. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're going to put a plaque up and you'll be remembered forever. Well, nothing wrong with the plaque, but that's not what God's talking about. He's talking about that you invest in the kingdom of God. You invest in eternity. And I want you to understand this. Because it's so much greater than what you can even imagine. When you do what God is giving us as an example of what these people did, when you give in this kind of grace giving, God says that your deeds are going into heaven. 
Your deeds are going into reaching people. Your deeds are going to be remembered forever. How are they remembered forever? Through the people that are reached. I want you to understand something. When you give this way, there will be a day when you draw your last breath here on this earth and you'll be ushered into the presence of God and thank God after the resurrection of the body we'll be reunited with a resurrected body and we'll live with God forever. But listen, I believe what this means and what this means will happen to you that there will be a day when you go to heaven and somebody's gonna come up to you and they're gonna say thank you. And you're gonna say for what? Because you gave Avalon Church was able to exist. Because you gave, the gospel was preached. And because you gave, I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you. Can you imagine how awesome that will be? Being able to know that because of what you did, out of a willing heart, what you did out of conviction of who Jesus is, out of love, out of thanksgiving, what you did is going to last forever. And it's going to last forever in people, in people. There will be children in heaven because of you. There will be teenagers in heaven because of you. There will be people in heaven, just talking about this church from Africa because of you. There are going to be people in heaven from the Netherlands because of you. There are going to be people in heaven from communist Cuba because of you. There are going to be people in heaven throughout Central America because you gave, because of you. There are going to be people from North Carolina and Georgia and Florida and Alabama and Michigan and Texas and uh, 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 Las Vegas, Nevada. I sort of say Las Vegas, but Nevada and uh, from California and from Haiti and uh, literally throughout the entire world because of you. You're going to meet brothers and sisters in heaven. And your investment is going to last forever through them because of you, because of you, because of you. I don't even know if I can get my head around how awesome that is. And so God says that your good deeds will be remembered forever. And then he says this, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. Anybody know what that means? Talking about your money. Not just that though. You ever need resources for parenting? Anybody ever had teenagers? You know what I'm talking about, right? You need sometimes you, you get beat down. Sometimes you're frazzled. Sometimes you've been working so hard. Sometimes life seems to be against you. Sometimes it seems like the problems will never end. And you know what you need? You need a resource that's going to give you wisdom of how to live. Sometimes you, you loved each other so much when you got married and you were just, there's never any way you thought possible that you would consider divorce. And there are times that what you need is a resource. Someone that's going to help you. Someone that's going to help you get through the dark times. Somebody that's going to talk to you and your spouse and help you to come together again. You need a resource. Sometimes we need resources for making a decision about our job. Sometimes we need resources when it comes to about furthering our education. Sometimes we need resources when we decide what kind of house we're going to buy, what kind of car we're going to buy. We need wisdom. We need resources. Let me just read that again. In the same way, he will provide. He will provide. Not you, Not your mom or your dad or your grandparents or some rich uncle that died and left you an inheritance. He, God, God Almighty will be the one that provides for you. He will provide and increase your resources. And then what does he do from that? He will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Isn't that beautiful? When I respond that way, the apostle Paul wrote to this Corinthian church so they would help the poor persecuted Christians at Jerusalem with an offering. And he bragged on them and their enthusiasm 
and he began to tell them what God would do because of their obedience. A couple things I want you to see. There are two things really in this passage that stand out to me that you need to understand what they mean. The first word is the word miracle. God talks about miracles here. And we all know what miracles are. We see miracles happen. Some people don't believe in miracles, but just look at the stars at night and you'll believe that there was someone that created that that was a lot bigger than you and I are, and it was a miracle. If you've ever been saved, if you follow Christ, you know that was a miracle. It was a miracle of life change. But a miracle is simply this. It is supernatural power working on my behalf. Not natural power, supernatural power working on your behalf. If you ever have God working on your behalf, you're going to come out okay. Now, if you get me to work on your behalf, I may or may not help. I don't know. I'll try. But I, there's no guarantee that I'm going to help you. I can promise you that. But when God's working on your behalf, wow, wow, God is able when you and I are not supernatural power. And here's the second thing I want you to see, the word enthusiasm. These people were enthusiastic about it. You ever been around a Christian that is so excited about something that maybe you're not doing or maybe you don't even think you should do, and you're like, that person is crazy, but they sure are enthusiastic about what they're doing. Well, these people were enthusiastic. I want you to understand something about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm spreads. That's what happened to this church. Their testimony, their actions spread, and it didn't just affect their church. It affected the church in Jerusalem and the church in Macedonia and literally churches all over the world because of their enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm, you know what it means? If you break it down, and this is not from the Greek language, but uh, in theos, you know what that means? It means God within. So real enthusiasm doesn't come from some preacher trying to pump you up or tell you a funny story or tell you one that brings a tear to your eye. Those are great and they're helpful. But listen, that is not what enthusiasm comes from. You can watch your favorite team score a touchdown and win the game in the last moment. And you're very enthusiastic, but that's not the kind of enthusiasm he's talking about. He's talking about something that comes from God being within you and at work through you. That is the kind of th enthusiasm that lasts. Your team may be good this year and bad next year. Your kids um, may be involved in dance and you think it's beautiful. And then the next year you realize that it's not. You just spent a whole lot of money. Anybody ever have kids in cheerleading? You know what I'm talking about? I, I'm not picking on cheerleaders, but you know how it is with softball and travel ball and all this kind of stuff. And some people are like, you know what? My kid's going to get a scholarship. Guess what? You're going to send them for, to Harvard for all you spent in all the years and not worry about a, a, a scholarship. But the point is this. Enthusiasm spreads, but so does negativity. So does negativity. When you start to say, you know what, that's a bunch of baloney. I don't believe that. All they do is talk about money down at that church. All they ever care about, they don't care about people, they just care about your money. I've, I've had people actually accuse me of the reason that I want to see more people saved and baptized and join the church is simply because it means more money in our church. And I got to tell you, not only does that offend me, it makes me angry. Because that is completely opposite of what we believe here at this church. Well, I've really spent a lot of time setting this up. And uh, as I often do, I spend a lot of time on the introduction and a short time on the points that I'm going give, to give you. So just relax because I've got six points, all right? And I've got 10 minutes and 34 seconds to do it. In. So uh, let me just give it to you. Number one, what does is, what is grace uh, giving do? It leads to miraculous living. Number one, grace giving leads to the miracle of a changed heart. Here's what it says, and we read this verse. I really don't need to write to you about this gift for the Christians in Jerusalem. For I know how eager you are to help, and I've been boasting to our friends in Macedonia that you Christians in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. 
Grace giving leads to the miracle of a changed heart. You want to see God begin to change your heart? Maybe you have, maybe your life is gripped by materialism or greed. By the way, don't think that just because a person has more money than you or a bigger house than you or a nicer car than you, that they are guilty of greed. They very well may not be. In fact, tithing breaks the grip of greed on our lives. And I've known people that are extremely wealthy that were not greedy at all. They were very generous. And I've known people that were broke as a convict, and they were as greedy as a person you've ever met in your life because all they thought about was money, 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 money. And you need to understand that what God does through your life, when you begin to do this grace giving and get your eyes on Jesus and believe what he says in the word of God, you know what begins to happen? He transforms your heart. And it's a beautiful thing. The second thing is grace giving leads to the miracle of participation. We say here at Avalon Church often that participation is membership. Um, We don't have a church that has a list of members that have not been here since 1932. There are many churches. In fact, the first church I was pastor of, we had 3,362 members on roll. I don't know why I remember that number, but I do. And you know that uh, when I became the pastor of that church, the average attendance was about 200. <laughs> we had 3,332 members, and most of them could not be found by the FBI. Okay? They hadn't been to church in years. We don't believe that is what just signing a piece of paper does not make you a member of anything. Well, it might make you a member of some things, but not the church. You know what we say? Participation is membership. In other words, if you're going to be a part of the church, be a part. It's a part of the body. It's about being active. It's not having your name on a roll that matters. Listen to what he says. It was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of them to begin helping. This church participated. They participated. Number three, grace giving leads to the miracle of generosity. When I began to let God get into my heart and understand what they understood, I will become a more generous person. Uh, in, in verses 6 and 7, it says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each make up your own mind as to how much you should give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. Cheerfully. Let God begin to stir up your heart. I've seen it in my own life. You know, we're affected by the way that we grow up. And um, my family um, was middle class for most of my young life until my dad became a pastor. And then we were very poor for a long time, very poor. And I remember it affected me. I went to Goodwill. Uh, My parents took me there to get my clothes when I was, you know, 10 years old, somewhere in there, 11 years old. And my dad had just gone into the ministry. And I'll never forget that. That back then, in case you're wondering, all of our millennials like, yeah, I go there all the time. It wasn't cool when I was a kid, all right? Just trust me. If you wore clothes from Goodwill, it wasn't like, hey, look at this recycled Prada that I found. It wasn't that. It was like some tie that uh, a guy got in 1932 that was ugly then and it was really ugly now. And so that began to affect my outlook. I started working during the summers on my grandpa's farm when I was 12 years old. And I would save that money, and I started buying my own clothes. And I started saying, you know what? I'm never, ever, ever going to wear garbage again. It affected my attitude. I paid cash for my first car when I was 16 years old, and I had an outlook on life. Uh, I had money in the bank. And I had a good job, and my goal in life was one thing. I was going to make some money. That was my goal. And my goal was that I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 30 years old. And um, i got to tell you that there was a time in my life that my outlook wasn't right. I'm not suggesting that if you've got goals like that, if you've got a goal to be a millionaire by the time you're 30, thank God. Just make sure that you're not greedy. Make sure that you've got the right attitude about it. And God blesses you and tithe to Avalon Church. Amen. All right. So, but my motivation wasn't right. And I, and I, I saw how that began to affect me. You know what 
changed my heart? You know what changed my mind about giving? You know what changed my mind about materialism and money and things of that nature? Is one thing, grace giving. I started learning how to do it when I was a young man. And God totally changed my life. The fourth thing we see is grace giving leads to the miracle of total provision. God will provide for you. I wish I had time to tell you stories of how God has provided for my wife and me throughout the years. It has been amazing. And how God's provided for this church. Uh, Verse 8, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you always have everything you need. He repeated it. That's kind of important. He's going to provide all you need and you're going to have plenty left over to share with others. You know what that tells me? That there are three levels of provision there. Need, you can live in that level. God promises to supply your need. Not greed, but need. But then there's another level, plenty. Got to guard for greed here. But when God begins to open the windows of heaven and pour out plenty in your life because of your obedience, because of your trust, because of your faith, God begins to bless you in ways that you never expected. He'll bless you financially. Uh, He'll bless you in your family and many, many other ways. And then there's a third level, which I hope some of you can get to. He goes from need to plenty to seed. It said he provides seed for the sower. Seed for the sower. So God goes and changes your heart from a person that says, it's just I got to have, you know, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And and I'm not mocking or making fun of those that live at the level of need. You're trusting God to supply your need. And that's wonderful. And that's a, a beginning of a beautiful grace journey in your life. But then you go to plenty and you begin to understand that when I practice grace giving, God's going to bless me and there are things that open up doors in my life that I couldn't have opened myself. But then you go to that third level where God begins to give you the opportunity to plant seed for harvest. That's what we want you to learn. Grace giving leads to the miracle of multiplication. God is the one that gives seed to the farmer or to the sower. Um... And by the way, in this context, it's money. He's talking about, in this, if we interpret Scripture correctly, and that's what we try to do here, in this context, the seed he's talking about is money. Now, I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. I'm far from it. But I challenge you to read the Word of God and discover anything other than blessings when you begin to give and to tithe and to give above the tithe and practice grace giving. Show me a verse where he says he doesn't bless you. Show me a verse. Yeah, there will be testings and there's going to be times like that. But you know what God promises? He promises to give seed to the sower. It's the miracle of multiplication. Uh, Verse number 10, And God will supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, I want you to understand that when it comes to the law of multiplication, there are three things you need to know. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. You want more love in your life? Sow some love. You want more kindness in your, you want people to be nicer to you? Be nice to others. You reap what you sow. Number two, you reap after you sow. And then number three, you reap more than you sow. And when I begin to understand this, it's life changing. Then finally, the last thought, grace living leads to the miracle of motivation. Motivation. God will multiply, but when I begin to see what God's doing, it's not about the money. It's not about the the seed. It's not about the need. It's not about uh, the plenty. That's not what it's about for me. It is about that I'm able to make an impact on the kingdom of God and that one day people are going to walk up to me and throw their arms around my neck and thank me for doing something that I didn't have to do, but I saw a big picture of who Jesus was and I wanted to get in on it. I wanted to see more people know Christ and that person is going to thank me for making it possible for them to go to heaven. And that's what it's about. And if it's about anything else for you, then you've got the wrong motivation. And my prayer is for you that God will give you the miracle of motivation. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thank God for his son, a gift 
too wonderful for words. When you begin to see Jesus, it's just too wonderful. It's just too much. It's just like, wow, how can, how can I possibly not get in on this life that God has for me? Well, that's my prayer for you today is that we all learn how to see God, to see Jesus through the lens of grace giving. And I think God will bless you for it. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you'd help us as a church to have the right motivation. Help us to understand what you're doing in our life and in our church. I pray that you bless our people, God. Lord, I pray for not only the people here, but the people that are not here yet. I pray for those that are going to be saved. I pray for those families that are going to be reunited. I pray for those teenagers that are going to meet Jesus. I pray for those children that are going to fall in love with Jesus because we were faithful. So, Father, I pray that you bless. Lord, I pray that you would save people that are not saved. And I pray that you do it today. Before we finish our prayer, maybe you're watching online and you'd say, Pastor Richie, I want to receive Jesus today. Maybe you're in the building today and you'd say, I need Christ as my Savior. Well, I want to invite you to pray and ask God simply to save you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So maybe you'll pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died for my sins. I'm asking you right now to save me, to forgive me, and to put me in a right relationship with God. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer today, online, please click that button to let us know that you received Christ today. If in the room today, please take the next step card in the seat pocket in front of you. Put your name on it and check that you prayed to receive Christ today. Drop it in the box on the way out to let us know how to connect with you and to get you to be able to take your next step in your faith life. I want to just end with praying for our campaign. Praying about what God would have me to do, what God would have you to do. I believe as a church, it's very important for us to pray. So let's pray together at this time. You pray about what God is speaking to you about. You pray for a bigger picture of Jesus. You pray that God would help you in that way. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with our church and bless us, Lord. Thank you for the many blessings you've already given us. The blessing of Jesus is enough, God. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be able to continue to reach people with the good news, to be able to position ourselves, to reach more people, to manage our mo- your money well. Uh, God, I pray that you bless us in this way. God, I pray for our people, God, that you'd reveal to them exactly what you want them to do. Give them a joy in their heart about it. And Lord, help them to be able to grow and connect and learn what you're going to do in their life because of their faith. And we want you to know that we love you and we bless you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.